on March the 8th, when I taught the first of my assigned series of lessons after Paul Adams had finished his, I was making jokes about our social distancing. And now I get to do the thing that public speakers have to do sometimes, and that is to eat the words they said. So here we are not together at a time when we really need to be together. And my big joke was that you all would be able to hear me streaming. So whatever that means, here we are. The reading today is 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. I'll read. But as to the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as travail comes upon a woman with child, and there will be no escape. But you are not in darkness, brethren, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. It's a young church. They had heard the message that Jesus died for our sins and was raised from the dead. And there would be resurrection for believers. And they loved it. And they expected it soon. We talked at length about the expectation of an imminent parousia, that Jesus was going to come back right away. And then he didn't. And so they got kind of worried about it because time had passed and some had died. And did that mean that they missed it? Or was the other possibility there that the second coming had already happened and they missed it? And so he wrote to them about times and seasons, though he sort of says, well, you really don't need to hear that, but we're going to do that anyway. One of my wife's favorite sayings from her childhood was when she and her family would go on car trips she and the others would sleep a while and wake a while and always ask, are we there yet? How many more towns do we have to go? These people were concerned, are we there yet? We said earlier about the famous theologian Paul Tillich that his statement was that all theology is eschatology, meaning that what happens to us at the end trumps everything else. One of my memories from earlier years when my dad was having serious health problems, especially depression, my mother said that she had gone and left him at home for several hours and when she got back home he was in a pretty serious state and had said to her plaintively, I couldn't wait for you to get back. I've been watching my eyes out. 
That's what these people had been doing. They were watching their eyes out and nothing happened. So it's time to begin thinking about the meaning of that and what is going to happen. And so he addresses them and it's very clear that he wrote to reassure them in their thinking and feelings. And I do have to say that in the midst of our current trouble, what's going to happen to us is very much on our minds. One of the things that we know about waiting and watching is that it's hard to tolerate uncertainty. In 1968, when I was director of admissions at Oklahoma Christian College, as it was called at the time, it's very important how people performed in class, the men I'm talking about, because if they didn't do well, they got drafted. And there was a high probability that they would be sent to Vietnam. And the death rate at that time was just terrible. On a particular day, a young man came in to see me and he was obviously in considerable distress. What he said was, I've been doing poorly. I haven't been going to class. I've been uh, virtually fl flunking all my classes because I haven't been doing anything. And so I suppose that I'm gonna have to drop out of school and of course I'm gonna get drafted right away. And I'm not even sure why I'm here talking to you about it. But anyway, here we are. Since I had then and do have now a problem solving approach to social problems, I propose that we try some steps and see if we could salvage something and perhaps prevent his being drafted. So we talked to each teacher and got a message from them about what he would have to do to salvage a surpassing grade in, in their class. And of course, because they were eager to help him, they laid out actions to take where he could do that. It was gonna be difficult, but it could be done. So he left my office and I found out in just a few days that he had gone directly from my office to enlist. He signed up and I'm sorry to tell you, he was sent to Vietnam and killed the first week he was there. If you're wondering if that kind of haunts me yet to this day, rest assured. He couldn't stand the, the uh, uncertainty, just intolerable not to know what's gonna happen. And so Paul in his great faith and confidence was reassuring them how things, how things were going to be. And says to them, uh, you already know about the day of the Lord, that it's like a thief in the night. And that is a fact. They did know that. In Hebrew history and scripture, there are many references in a variety of ways to the day of the Lord and virtually every mention of it treats it as something that will be sudden, abrupt, uh, will not be based on anything that necessarily is going on at the moment. It will simply be the time when the Lord makes his appearance, interrupts human history, and does whatever it is he whatever it is he wants to know. Uh, that uh, phrase, a thief in the night, is a particularly meaningful one to Judy and me after this last summer. We took a three week trip to Great Britain in August, had a grand time, and as you know, we collect Blue Willow China. 
and we were especially successful in finding pieces this year. And so we loaded up, had to buy a couple of extra suitcases and got home late on a Thursday evening, uncomfortable, but anticipating unpacking to be sure our stuff made it. We didn't want to hear that noise that the suitcase makes when you shake it if it's things are not well. We got everything out and we're putting it on the kitchen table and we only had one broken piece and we were happy about that. And then we walked in our bedroom and discovered that while we were gone, we had been burglarized. A thief had simply broken into our back door and carried off Judy's jewelry chest with everything in it. It uh, was a, a feeling of having been violated. It was simply gone. Uh, there were no steps to take to get it back at that moment. We left it as it was because it was late at night and called the police the next morning and they came and filled out some papers. We, of course, filed an insurance claim. And then my patter about that <clears throat> later was we got robbed twice. Once by the burglar and once by the insurance company. It turns out that stuff was not covered, except minimally. They don't like to insure guns, furs, coins, or jewelry. That uh, feeling, I'm pretty sure, is going to linger for a while. Uh, it was just stuff, but it was stuff that we had accumulated in 54 years of being married, and it was uh, all precious, precious things. The Thief in the Night is one figure of speech to talk about the, the day of the Lord. And of course, we immediately think of Jesus' words, uh, lay not up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and thieves break through and steal. About that moth consumption, I'm sure that most of the men in here have had this experience. There's been a suit that you have worn for a while. Maybe you were saving it and using it for a funeral suit. And I've laughed with many of you about my hatred for wearing suits and about the only time you're going to catch me wearing one is in the preparation for a funeral and so you don't want to get used to it. And so you take the plastic off your favorite suit and find that a moth has eaten a hole right in the most conspicuous front of your suit. Uh, that's uh, unnerving. Uh, gives us a feeling of, oh gosh, that wasn't what I expected, certainly wasn't what I wanted. And for the ladies, like a woman with child in travail, and there is no escape. I suspect that most of you know uh, our daughter, Mindy, who is a medical doctor and practices with our son, Trey, over on Eastern, just above, just north of uh, Smiling Hills Boulevard. She's in her 40s now. And uh, I have a very powerful memory of Judy and me on a Monday night sitting in our home in Edmond watching the TV program I Spy. Judy asked me what time it was, and I told her. Five minutes later, she said, what time is it? And I told her, and five minutes later, she said, what time is it? And by then, even a slow learner like me discerned that she was about ready to go to the hospital to have our daughter, Mindy. And now she's kind of a Ben Casey or a Dr. Welby for this community. And when our son Trey was born, my wife said, can we not call this off and just go home? I'm not, I'm not sure I want to go through with this. Uh, and his point of that 
of course, is that don't make any mistake about it. Uh, the day of the Lord is coming. That is going to happen. What they were looking for, he says, is peace and security. Brother, I think we would agree right now, would we not, that we're not we, we're not abundantly fixed with that right at this moment. I, I think it's safe to say that the world is in a greater uproar than it's ever been during my lifetime, greater uncertainty. And uh, uh, we, we would trade some high prices for some peace and security. When I think about that, I think back to my childhood <clears throat> when my maternal grandparents lived on a farm in Johnston County. They were sharecroppers, did uh, drudgery work, but I have to say, it appearances to, to me as a boy, uh, enjoyed life a lot and did what they could to help us enjoy life a lot and, and were successful at it. Many nights, especially if Quite a few people gathered for the family gathering on the weekend. It would be, let's say it's Friday night and we've had supper. The front porch of that house was on the east side. So we would all gather, sometimes as many as 15, in various positions on that front porch. Some of the chairs from the kitchen cane bottom chairs were carried out there and people leaned back against the wall. Others sat on the porch. Some stood up leaning against the posts. Uh, some smoked, some dipped snuff. Occasionally somebody put forth one of their cuckoo ideas. And there I was as a child feeling peace and security. These were the adults. They were, they, were, they were getting it right. At that moment, conditions were adequate to meet the needs that we had, and the people who knew were in charge. There have been other times, of course, when I have felt that particular set of feelings it just so happens that those were particularly meaningful and I was sitting there listening to all that adult conversation hoping nobody noticed me and ran me off because I was really enjoying that. And he emphasizes the variation between uh, day and night. We are not to be of the night I'm sure that most of you have said to your kids, there's not much very good that goes on after midnight. If you're out at that time, things probably are not going exactly the way I want them to go. Bad things happen at night under cover of darkness. We know, of course, what those are. And he emphasizes that we are not to make the night kind of thing the way we are. I had a professor in college that said, the history of the world can be measured by the battle against darkness. And we've all seen those pictures from outer space where there are areas that are all light and areas that are dark and there's something kind of threatening about those areas that are all dark. Back to my childhood, this particular place that we lived in 1947 didn't have electric power yet. This is in Jefferson County. The REA brought power to our area in 1947. They put in the lines and People came and wired the house using those uh, 
ceramic holders where the wires were wired through those and they just left them on the surface. They didn't bother to put them in the attic or wherever. And all of a sudden we had light and power uh, and warmth. Uh, one of my memories was uh, this one particular year, we ordered a bunch of baby chickens. It was uh, spring and time for, for them to start hatching. So they delivered them and that very night we had a big cold snap, a really cold snap. And we had to bring those chickens in the house and have them in their box uh, up by the stove so they wouldn't all die. Uh, what an adventure that was. You can imagine how the house smelled. But getting those lights was so meaningful that uh, I still feel that contrast even yet after all these years. What we had before, of course, was kerosene lamps. Not too long ago, our power went off, and so we lit up some of our kerosene lamps, and it was pretty dark. And if you were really serious about reading, you tried to get next to the Aladdin lamp because it was a good deal brighter. And all of a sudden, here we had power and could see everything that was going on. A little story that's one of my favorites about that business of the houses being wired. My good friend, Will Jones, who was a son of a, a significant construction leader, worked for his dad in construction. One particular day, he had delivered a load of stuff in a truck that had an A-frame on the back. And somehow he managed to get the wiring for the house tangled up with that A-frame, and when he pulled away, he unwired that house. <laughs> We've had some good laughs about that. So, uh, of course, when we get together, well, we're always telling who was the most outrageous. Can you, can you top this? I never unwired a house, so I suppose he's ahead on that. And I suspect that most of us have had the experience of being in a cave somewhere where the guide would cause the lights to be turned off and it's so absolute, absolutely dark that you can literally not see anything. Can't see your hand right in front of your face. I've got a little reading that I want to do for you as, as we talk about that. This is from a book, Atlantic Journey by H.V. Morton. H.V. Morton was a well-known London journalist who did trips all over the UK and the rest of the world too, and then would write books about his trips uh, in search of England, in search of Scotland, the call of England in Scotland again, and et cetera, et cetera. In August of 1941, before the U.S. entered World War II, Winston Churchill and FDR made a date to have a meeting in Placentia Bay in Newfoundland. Churchill was to sail across the Atlantic in the new super, light, super uh, battleship, Prince of Wales, and FDR kind of sneaked out to meet him up there, and they did that early in August of, uh, as I said, of 1941. Two reporters were picked to go on that trip, one of whom was H.V. Morton. He, of course, was not allowed to post anything until after the trip was over, and he wrote this book, Atlantic Meeting, and there's this passage about light that I want to read. Uh, Churchill and FDR are going to have dinner on one of the ships in the evening. So Mr. Churchill left in the Admiral's barge that evening as he went off to dine with Mr. Roosevelt. I watched him go and then went in to dinner. When I came on deck again, it was dark. And as I glanced around, I caught my breath in amazement for the ships were not blacked out. 
they lay at anchor rows of golden pinpoints most beautiful to see. And beneath each ship, the rows of lights wavered and trembled on the water. I had seen nothing like that for two years. On shore, too, a dwelling invisible by day, perhaps a little shack or cabin, proclaimed itself by a spark that was a lighted window. How can I describe the heart-catching beauty of that sight? All Europe was dark, yet here in this lonely land, among deserted bays and barren hills, the lights were still shining. Women had never caught up their infants to their breasts in fear. Men had never crouched like animals in the dark, listening to the sound of an enemy above them in the sky. Most surprising of all was that our own great ship, undarkened now for the first time in her life. She was the largest ship in the bay, and she lay there like a memory of Brighton Pier. An officer told me that the American warships had made no blackout precautions. Therefore, it was decided to undarken the Prince of Wales because the presence among so many lights of one large dark battleship would have looked suspicious from the air. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not likely that the Germans will send over long range bombers, said this officer, because they could never make the homeward journey. Still, you never know. I stayed there a long time, unable to leave that fearless scene, the joy of light. Paul Harvey always said, of course, there's the rest of the story. This was in early August of 1941. On December the 10th of 1941, the Prince of Wales, a magnificent battleship was sunk in the Far East by the Japanese. A terrible tragedy. When we talk about crime, we know that a big part of it is done at night. People are out and about taking advantage of the darkness. And I have proposed several times that one of the techniques that we use to catch wrongdoers is to find out who's in bed and still in bed at 11 o'clock because people can't stay up 24 hours. So they sleep in the daytime and do their bad business at night. Paul's message is penetrating and simple. Let us be awake. For several years, when I taught psychology at Oklahoma Christian College, as it was called then, I taught freshman psychology at 8 o'clock on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That was a bad choice of time. Those Children, large though they were, were not ready for that at eight o'clock. Wasn't very successful, so fortunately after a few years, I, though being a slow learner, figured that out and changed the time so that people could come at a more convenient time. And as Paul says about the status of things, whether we sleep, whether somebody has died or whether we are alive, we live with him. Eternal life is a commodity already possessed qualitatively and quantitatively by the believer in the New Testament, especially in John and Paul. And so he concludes his message. Let us encourage and build one another up as you are doing. <clears throat> there certainly have been many times in my life when I needed encouragement and building up, and I'll just do one because it was especially poignant for me. When it was time for me to go to college, I wanted to go to Central Christian College at Bartlesville, Oklahoma, 
So my dad and I went up there on a warm spring day to see about enrolling and to make arrangements. Uh, we were greeted by James O. Barrett, who was president, who turned us over to Hugo McCord to take us around. And Dr. Baird, uh, my dad told him that I was gonna need to work uh, while I went to college to, to pay for it. Uh, they had uh, three jobs driving school buses for the Limestone District, which was a suburb of Bartlesville. And Dr. Baird made arrangements for me to meet with the principal there and the board to see about getting one of those jobs driving a school bus. I, the, the thought of it terrified me. I never had driven a school bus. My dad and I met with them and they hired me on the spot. And what I thought about almost nonstop for the next few days was, how in the world am I gonna get some experience driving a school bus so I don't show up to do that, but not knowing how. The principal of the high school at Purcell happened to be a good family friend of ours. And I was talking to him about it. And he said, well, I can help you a little bit. We've bought a new bus at Durant and we need somebody to drive it up here. And I'll let you, I'll drive you down there and you can drive it home to practice. Oh, well, great. So that's what I did. It was a medium sized bus. I don't know what the seating capacity was, but it was not a huge bus. As I recall, it had either a four or five speed transmission and was easy. So I drove it home being very careful, but there was no other occasion for me to drive a school bus until I enrolled in college in the fall. <clears throat> to say that I was scared to death would be an understatement. And when I got to the school, it the bus was in a garage and it was a 66 passenger bus about a mile long. First, I had to back it out of that garage and then I had to drive it. Having driven a school bus exactly one time in my life. I was not then and am not now an especially brave person. And I, I was uh, fearful, I guess would be the best way to put that. I worried a lot about it, but didn't have much choice. So I went ahead and did what I had to do. The man who had driven one of the buses for that school district the year before happened to be on campus and I met him and somehow we got around to say that I had gotten that job and was driving that and it was scaring the heck out of me. And he said, well, let me reassure you about that. Now, incidentally, this guy's name was Joe Glasgow and he was from Oklahoma City. He was older than me, kind of a calm uh, guy and reassuring. And he said, I, 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 I was worried too when I started doing that, but as I did it more and more, I found out that I got quite good at it. And I think I can promise you that you will be able to do that without too much trouble. I think you ought to have confidence in yourself. I still recall the feeling that that produced in me, uh, that he had encouraged me and, and, and built me up. There are many lessons in Thessalonians for us. And I think it goes without saying that, that we ought to encourage each other and build each other up. Sort of goes without saying. Can we close with a prayer? Lord, in the midst of this difficult time, when some of us are in bad health and all of us are somewhat fearful and unnerved. Help us to be people of faith and courage and depend on you and recognize that your world and your way will have its way. Bless us till we can be back together in Jesus' name, amen.